And I, I've never been in front of a GoPro before. So uh, to me, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, yeah, so it really does start at 12. You really do have to be here. This is stuff they're going to ask you on, their, on the boards. Almost guaranteed. Will they ask all of it? No, obviously not. But it's really basic stuff. Um, you know, from time to time, speakers decide they're too important to show up for their obligations. In those cases, Dr. Parker is in charge of rounding up interesting films for everyone to review. And then, um, as you, as Nick can probably tell you, I have this lecture on anticoagulants that's a little too long. <laughs> I've never been able to get through it. So, although it scheduled, there are scheduled times when I have to fill in, we can pick up where we left off. But uh, people will uh, find that that's a little embarrassing because they make people stand up and tell me things. Welcome back. Okay, so today we're going to talk about pressure measurement, which is kind of an important thing. And it's something you do every day, whether you do it in the echo lab, uh, the CCU, or the cath lab. Nuclear guys don't do it, but we're only talking about meaningful parts of cardiology. Here. Uh, even the EP guys do it from time to time. And uh, the principles that I'm going to talk about are probably as important, as important in the Doppler world as in the uh, not-so-Doppler world. So, Dr. Patel, how many of these guys can you identify? Wow. Uh, fortunately, none. None? Oh, man. I'm sorry. Okay. Nadia. No, sir. <laughs> I don't okay. know. <laughs> Santhi? I don't know. Nick? Jeff? Uh, Mason Sons. One of them. Wrong. <laughs> you would know who Mason know that, Song, yeah. what Mason Sons is. He doesn't look like these guys. <laughs> okay, so. What are these? Boots. These are boots. Uh, when did people wear boots like this? They still wear them. It's probably World War One. Right. This is a World War One outfit, right? You don't see soldiers. I mean, this guy's a soldier, right? So you don't see soldiers in the Second World War wearing boots like that. I mean, you know, Nazi generals, maybe, but uh, that's probably stuff from movies. What's this? Okay. It's a boat. See bunkers in World War II like this? This is a World War I bunker. Okay, this gives you an idea about the time period. Is this the way people dress in 2015? Yes. So this doesn't help. Is this the way they take portraits in this decade? No. No, okay. So you get the idea of this. What else do all these guys have in common? They're all men. One at a time. They're all men. All men. White. They're all white. <laughs> They're all wearing it. Although, you know, if you watch uh, Gates' stuff on TV, you, you can't say the phenotype is meaningless. None of them are smiling. None of them are smiling. What else? They must be in the forehead because they have pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Something else. They're all. Tedious. Dead. Dead. <laughs> okay. And they've all been to. Come on, one city. If you're important enough to have your slide shown in CAF conference, there's one city that's important in your life. And where's that? One city. One city. Berlin. Wrong. New York. Wrong. Boston. Wrong. LA. Wrong. <laughs> Houston. Wrong. Paris. Huh? Paris. No. Stockholm. Stockholm. Why do they go to Stockholm? Nobel Prize. 
They won the Nobel Prize, 1953 or six. So who are they? The guy in the middle looks familiar. I'm not sure. Kurt, Kurt this one, I think. Kurt Nott. Okay, good. That's Kurt Nott, okay. I think. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, uh, <laughs> you can make it up. I mean, <laughs> it's not going to be. It's actually <laughs> German. Don't be honest. <laughs> so if one is Kurnan, who are the other guys? Do you know what I think? Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair question. <laughs> okay, so when you think of Kurnan, two other names should come to mind. Okay, so there's stuff that you got to know. I mean, yes, you one can't is a, say a German. I, one is a German. One is a German, right. I think <laughs> it's this guy. The guy in the boots. And that's his name. Ah, uh, that's. So, what do you call His name's Forsman. 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 That's okay. Forsman. So, if one's Kurnan, after whom they named Kurnan the capital, uh, one's Forsman, who's the other? And they won't ask you on the boards. Don't worry. When they have the video part, this won't be on. The other guy's Richards. So, Forsman, Cornell, and Richards. So the way things worked out, if you don't know, and this is you know sort of like knowing who George Washington was. Um, in the 30s, Forsman was a neurology resident. He was a little high. And he said, what happens if I measure pressures in the heart? And so what did he do? Do you know the story? Yes? Yes? Maybe. Yes? No, no. OK, so here's what happens. So he said, I'm going to measure pressures in the heart with a catheter. And so if you're a urologist, what kind of catheters do you have? Foley. Yeah, OK. So Foley catheter. The story is he tells his uh, faithful nurse he's going to uh, measure pressures in her heart. He's going to tie down her hands so she can't back out. He ties her down and then cuts down to his own forearm. Gets the brachial vein up. Gets catheter in using a fluoroscope. Puts a catheter where? Where? Superior vena cava. He never got into the heart. So it just shows you things go slowly. And, you know, things, you know, th this is true for everything I think that we do. You know, they build on basic principles. So he puts catheter in, into his superior vena cave, walks down a flight of stairs to Grand Rounds, where there's a fluoroscope. They're all sitting in their bow ties. And they say, oh, he said, they say, what have you done? He says, well, I just stuck a catheter into my heart. Look. And so he was rewarded for that. And how was he rewarded? No, no Fire. 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 <laughs> so he didn't have to take coal that night. OK. And following that, his other contributions to science were? Yeah, his other contributions were zero. Yeah, now, as I think about it, if he's a resident in the late 30s, he would not have been the same as George Bush. So that's probably Richards, you would guess. Um, yeah, so that was his only contribution. But then, on this side of the Atlantic, uh, Cournot, Richards, uh, Harvey, and a uh, guy named Jim Alexander, who, anyone know him? Uh, he actually was. Here is one of our grand old men for the world. You know, he died in the early 90s. Uh, those guys did the first hemodynamic studies. And what they actually did is they took catheters, molded them by hand, advanced them through the brachial vein to the right side of the heart, and actually got into the pulmonary artery and measured pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. They did this over a series of 30 years in a variety of disease, you know, healthy people in a variety of disease states. Publish, you know, you don't get a Nobel Prize for doing your own thing, 
you know, there's a long list of publications that these guys did, when they were at NYU and, and then Columbia. And uh, subsequently, they won the Nobel Prize. But they, these guys started what we do. I, I really think we owe everything we do uh, to uh, Forsman's lunacy and Wilkinson Richards and Benjamin Cornell's vision. Uh, so, you know, that's the nice side of all this. Okay, so uh, what we're going to be talking about are pressures. And if you uh, go back to basic physics, this is what pressure is. It's a force divided by a unit area. So if you think about it, all the forces we measure come from cardiac contractility, potential energy in the form of electrochemical bonds, is converted to kinetic energy <clears throat> as the heart contracts, forces blood forward, and then it's converted to potential energy as uh, vessels expand. And then as vessel, vessels rebound, that potential energy is converted back to kinetic energy. So we'll talk about energy dissipation. Um, and you know, I wouldn't say energy loss, but conversion into non-measurable forms of energy. Uh, but this is the fundamental thing that we're measuring. How much force can be generated per unit area? And that's all a transducer does. So when you measure pressures, all you're doing is you're taking a measuring device of known size and asking how much force is going to distend it. And as I said, we will talk about energy and the fact that you know there are lots of ways potential and kinetic energy are, are interconverted as you measure pressures. Don't forget about Harvey and Korotkov. The other thing that I want to point out to you is um, there are a variety of different kinds of pressures that we measure. So basal pressure, which really is what we adjust for when we zero transducers. Hydrostatic pressure, which is you know really what you're measuring. <coughs> um, this is what Harvey measured when he measured in the horse. Do you remember that story? I mean, what did he do? Nothing fancy. He stuck a tube in a horse's artery, measured how far the blood rose. And then, uh, knowing that blood and mercury have different densities, subsequently when Karatkov came along and said, okay, we're going to have a non-invasive way of measuring blood pressure, all he did was convert you know, density of water into the dead height of a column of water to the height of a column of mercury. And then the dynamic pressure, which is really the issue that we face as pressures change. And we uh, constantly have to deal with the question of whether our devices are accurate or adequate to measure rapid changes in pressure. Because if you think about it, the pressures that we measure are changing very rapidly. Okay, so we'll talk about manometers, which are devices that we use to measure pressure. Strain gauges. Um, you guys know what a Wheatstone bridge is? Been to this lecture enough times. Okay. Talk about resonant frequency. We'll talk about Fourier transforms. Does anyone understand the mathematics of Fourier transformation? Great, because I don't either. But you have to know what it is. Fundamental frequencies and damping. So this is a picture of an old style transducer. And what are we looking at here? Neil, tell me what we're looking at. Hirsch? Great, it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's exactly what it is. It's a drum. It's a diaphragm. This is this thing that looks like a wire is a wire. <laughs> so, uh, so these are the two important things. So if you think about it. It's an electromagnetic. Well, it's, there's nothing magnetic about it. So what happens when the heart beats? Pressure is transmitted. It's transmitted to a catheter. The catheter is connected to a transducer. This is the transducer. So really, what you have is a column of fluid extending out this way. Collinear transducer. What happens to this device as pressure is exerted? Well, it doesn't necessarily oscillate. It gets stretched, right? And that's the basic principle of a pressure transducer. It gets stretched as pressure is exerted, and then as the pressure drops, it returns to its initial position. So. Go back to like fifth or sixth grade when they're teaching you about electric circuits. So you've got a wire, and now you pull on it. What happens? It becomes long, it becomes slightly longer and slightly narrower. Increase the resistance. Ah, it's coming back now, right? Yeah. So if you take a wire and stretch it, you increase the electrical resistance. And that occurs proportionally to how far you stretch it. So if you think about it in really basic terms, the more you stretch a wire, the greater the pressure, the greater the increase in resistance. And so that's what happens right here. Uh, this wire is really very simply a circuit that's connected to this two-dimensional wire. And consequently, uh, all you're doing when you're measuring a pressure with a transducer is you're measuring the change in electrical resistance along that wire. Now, here's a device, a uh, uh, circuit called a Wheatstone Bridge. And I always have to look at this formula before I give this lecture to remember what we're doing. And really, all it tells you is that if you measure the voltage drop between these two circuits and you know two of the resistances, rather three of the resistances, you can calculate the flow. So uh, what you have here are uh, two resistors. This one's the transducer. This one's a fixed resistance. In the middle, you have a galvanometer, which is really turns out to be what? In, in the cat flight. Where, where's your galvanometer? It's the battery. Hmm? It's the electric output. Well, it's really the thing that the nurse watches is monitoring the patient. It's your recording system. And all you're doing is trying to keep the galvanometer at zero. So how do you do that? You balance the resistance in the two circuits according to the ratio between the two. So you don't know what this one is. You do know what these two are. This one's very So you can adjust the ratio between these two so that it's equal to this ratio. And then if you know how much you set this resistance at, you can easily calculate what this resistance is. So all you're trying to do is balance the resistance across the two circuits. And that's how you determine what the pressure is. Remember, knowing that this unknown resistance is really related to how much that transducer is being stretched. Now, um, transducers don't look like this anymore. 
When I was a fellow, they did. They're now a lot simpler. <coughs> They're now disposable. These things were not disposable. These things we kept for months. But, you know, they're now cheap, disposable. And uh, generally, they have this Wheatstone Bridge built in now. And, you know, it doesn't look like that anymore. Back in, <coughs> in the day, <coughs> the nurse doing the monitoring used to spend a long time balancing the circuits, making sure that the zero was set properly. It, that's now simply a push of a button. But in the day, the nurse had to adjust the dial, and you know, go back and forth. It would take a fair amount of time to balance those resistances out so you knew what pressure would be down at the uh, low end, you call that zero, and up at the high end, according to the scale. And every time you change scales, you had to balance it. These days, this is built into the back of the uh, transducer. And the circuits get a little more complicated. Uh, Nadja, can you read these? <laughs> read this aloud for us. Okay, that's excellent. Okay. I, and this just gives you examples of uh, the fact that as you deflect the circuits, I deflect the uh, transducer, meaning the diaphragm bounces back and forth, and the wire moves up and down. You change the resistances. And the rate at which this happens is dynamic, depending on changes in the pressure. The rate at which the pressure changes, which is largely dependent on? Change Yeah, but that's dependent on what? How, How rapidly it that change? Yeah, what, what determines that? How much force is it doing? How much force is exerted, how rapidly the force is exerted, which is determined largely by, well, heart rate and arterial compliance. And one of the arts of building a transducer and selecting a transducer for your needs is knowing which ones can handle these rapid changes and which ones can't. So if you're doing very precise hemodynamic work, what do you end up using? Well, you end up using transducers that are actually mounted on the tip of the catheter. And they, they can record these accurately many thousands of times better than the transducers that we use clinically. So, anyone here from heart failure? Anyone rotating through heart failure now? Okay, so cover your ears. Yeah, so if somebody's wedge is 9 millimeters or 12 millimeters, it doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, you know, in an experimental model, you need much more precision than that. I mean, you would never, you know, if you're doing an animal model of, uh, you know, mitral regurgitation, you'd never tell me that the 3 millimeter difference in filling pressure wasn't important. Clinically, though, it really isn't because you know that it's going to vary, you know, over the next hour. So, you know, I put this up just to tell you that, you know, if you, if after this lecture you're really inspired and you go up to the cath lab and, you, you know, you say, Climbing, can I borrow your magnifying glasses? And I say, yeah, sure. And you go, say, I want to watch that transducer move. You're looking for very small fluctuations. <coughs> so that this is not going to stretch like a string on a boat. It is 1% modulation of resistance. And as you amplify uh, that difference, you, know, you can translate that into a meaningful pressure. Now, I'm just going to go through this. Probably not. Okay. So, um, Fourier's theorem. So let's switch to actually what you're getting on the monitor. 
And so just remember that galvanometer in the middle of the Wheatstone Bridge, all the nurse monitoring the case has is that galvanometer and an amplifier. So it's just like a stereo amplifier. It takes a very tiny signal, tiny differences in resistance, and magnifies them many times. So as you change the scale, all you're doing is saying, hey, I like this music, turn up the volume. So how do you interpret these things? Well, it's important to know Fourier's theorem. <coughs> And Fourier's theorem is, at least on a level that normal human beings can understand, uh, very simple. And that's that any continuous function, and it's got to be continuous, it cannot be discontinuous. So we're not talking about bumps in pressure, we're not talking about waveforms that are irregular. But any continuous function can be produced as an infinite sum of sine and cosine waves. So you may have seen this, or maybe not. This is a sine wave. If you decrease the wavelength, which is called the second harmonic, because now you have a wavelength that is one half, or a frequency, inverse of wavelength, that's now twice the initial wavelength. So the second harmonic. You can see that it looks not like a single wave, but as a wave that passes through a node. Third harmonic, three waves, etc. We go down to second. Now imagine that you're working backwards, which is what nature does. Nature works one way, we try to unravel it by working the other direction. So you're creating, and this has been done, you're creating a pressure wave. What are you going to do? You're going to take these waves and start adding them together. And if you add them together, you have that control here. See over here? Yeah. <coughs> so if you start adding these things together, you know, if you're trying to get <coughs> maybe you guys should forgive. Uh, a little bit. Um, if you're nature and you're trying to produce waves that look like this, you're not going to take uh, these multiple harmonics and add them very simply. You're going to start shifting the phases. So although all these nodes line up, um, you'll see that as you get down here, the amplitude decreases. Uh, you're going to start shifting the phase, so you pull this wave over a little bit, and you pull this wave over a little more, a little less. And then the summation of these waves will add up to look like a pressure tracing when there's <coughs> continuous repetitive waveform. Now look, I mean, we don't add these together. What can be done mathematically is if you take changes in pressure that follow this contour, they can be, this can be mathematically broken down into a series of sine waves. So that's really what we do mathematically. Now, we do not do this day to day. But what's important to know is that as the quality of the transducer, or the transducer system decreases, what happens? These lower amplitude waves are no longer transmitted. So now you get fewer of these harmonics, and what's the result? The result is this tracing starts to deteriorate. 
And so you may lose the anachronic notch here, so you may get something that looks like that. Take out a few more harmonics, and we do this all the time. And now you get something <coughs> that looks like that. Now what's the truth? The truth is, sometimes this is adequate. Sometimes it's not. So for example, uh, if we're in the Tavar world, and we're trying to see if there's an anachronic notch present, if there's a dichronic notch, where it falls timing-wise, this won't do. Uh, on the other hand, for the anesthesiologist, who's trying to decide, should he give vasoconstrictors, should he back off from pressors, this may be enough. The general rule is that to have, and this you should remember, the general rule is that to have an adequate pressure tracing, you need the first 10 harmonics reproduced. And that, uh, you know, that becomes important, at least it used to be important when you had a bi-transducer, you know, when you would say, what's, the, uh, what's this transducer able to do? Is it worth spending this part of our cath lab budget on better transducers, or are we just buying something we really don't need? So if you wanted to buy uh, transducer tip catheters today, for example, you would spend a lot of money for something that uh, really doesn't have much clinical application. And, you know, I'm not sure in humans uh, you can control enough things so that it has much research application, although, you know, there's a large school of thought that doesn't agree with that. Um, But you want to know what the natural or fundamental frequency of a transducer is. Every transducer that you buy, you know, comes with specifications, just like a car. Uh, the higher the natural frequency, the more harmonics it's able to reproduce. So the higher the fidelity. And I, we don't, we're not going to be able to talk about what the natural frequency really means. Uh, other, and the, the only thing you need to know is that that's you know, a measure of the quality of the transducer that uh, you do that you do uh, use. This you do need to know. Uh, damping. Now you all have a sense of what damping is, right? And it's usually something bad, yes. good or bad. Okay, so I count uh, five both, <laughs> five bad, uh, somewhat undecisive. Misleading. Paulino? Misleading. Misleading? <laughs> no. Well, it's good and bad. So there is such a thing as optimal damping. You can have a system that is underdamped. More commonly, we see systems that are overdamped. The risk, uh, the thing associated with underdamping is uh, as you approach the natural frequency of the transducer, you start amplifying those tenth harmonics, those small amplitude sine waves uh, start getting amplified and you start getting distortions in the pressure. So you start getting an inaccurate pressure, particularly dynamic pressure. So damping is technically defined as the amount of energy loss, and you know, energy is not lost. I mean, uh, you know that energy is conserved. But uh, it's the conversion of energy between forms, between potential and kinetic energy, that occurs when a system transmits from one level to another, meaning when the pressure changes. So if you want to measure a static pressure, you'd be okay damping. 
but as the pressure changes, uh, energy is transformed into a form that you can't measure unless you have micro probes that can measure trivial changes in the temperature of your uh, measuring system. So um, when we talk about damping, we're talking about the ability of a transducer to measure pressures and the ability of the system to which it's connected to transmit pressures. So damping uh, minimizes resonance, which resonance is really over damping. So as you get close to the fundamental frequency, resonance means that you're amplifying those, sm those small components. It's a little bit like the story of the uh, bridge in Tacoma that had a fundamental frequency that the wind happened to hit and started swaying a little, then it swayed a lot, then it broke and collapsed. That's what resonance is. That's why you would have liked something to damp those vibrations. Uh, you can calculate the amount of damping. Damping coefficient, abbreviated as beta, is given by a very simple equation that uh, you will be asked to uh, come up with in the middle of a difficult case. <laughs> this is it. So, uh, Nadja, Nick, close your eyes and recite it. Cheap or something, bitch. Okay, pretty good. What is DT one? I forget. <laughs> but it, it turns out that there is something called optimal damping, which uh, yeah, is referred to here. So there is a certain amount of damping that you really do want. And you know, I used to look up these equations before the lecture, go into them forget them immediately afterwards. The only thing is the fellows forgot them sooner than I did. So I thought it probably wasn't worth uh, going into it. But, you know, suffice it to say, there is some damping that you want in the system. So a steel tube probably won't do it. Uh, and what this means is that if you come close to the fundamental frequency of the transducer, it won't bounce like a spring. It turns to zero and then stops. And we actually used to test for this, the biomedical guys did at one time. This was called a square wave test. And the square wave test was really simple. They take a 60 mil lure lock syringe, they connect it to the transducer, they pull, and then release. And you'd measure the oscillations in the transducer and how long it took, took the pressure to return to zero. And if it didn't return to zero very quickly, then it was time to discard the transducer. Now, um, th this is an example of ways that we do damp vibrations. What's this? What's this picture of? Shock absorbers. Okay. Anyone ever buy shock absorbers for their car? Okay, well I have. Um, so a shock absorber does what? Think about the suspension of a car. It's got a spring. Who's actually been underneath their car? Okay. So, you know, uh, in the old days cars had these leaf springs. Now they have coils. So what happens? The chassis is mounted on a spring which connects it the bottom of the suspension, basically to the axle with control arms, right? So if you go over a bump, what happens? The spring goes like this, right? It oscillates. And then eventually returns to zero. The question is, is that is that shaped up too much? Or does your tire actually come off the road every time it bumps? Tire off the road is a bad thing. <laughs> Trust me on that one. <laughs> uh, so the cars, the car came along with an invention to damp that oscillation, shock absorber. So the shock absorber is not here, it's not invented to make your ride more comfortable. The shock absorber was intended to keep your tires on the road. So if you go into the market for shock absorbers and look at high-end or racing shocks, they're rated according to how much heat they can handle. 
you touch a shock absorber after someone's been driving, it's hot. The oil in this system has absorbed vibrations and converted kinetic energy, or one form of kinetic energy, into another heat. That's what a shock absorber does. It damps a vibration, and it gets hot in tension. So, you know, if you're racing, for example, uh, you know, and you've got a lot of high-speed demands on your uh, transmission, these shocks get hot very quickly. So, you know, people who've got racing cars spend a lot of money for shocks. And uh, these shocks are expensive mainly because they're designed to handle very high temperatures. Th this is, to me, it's, it's the best illustration there is of the damping principle. And then this is, uh, well, what is this? A bridge. Which bridge? No. It's the Tacoma Bridge. Well, you would think at this point in the lecture I would show you the Tacoma Bridge, but I cheated. It's the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, not to be confused with the Wheatstone Bridge. And, you know, this is, uh, this is an example of different degrees of damping. So, uh, here's a pressure that's transmitted with no damping. This zeta is uh, substituted for what was what's normally represented by beta. No damping. Coefficient of point 0.1. You notice that the coefficient of point 0.7 when you introduce uh, you know, a force that you release here, you get nearly a straight line. So this is optimal damping. This is under damping. I'm sorry. Optimal damping, under damping, over damping. And this is the pop test, or the square wave test, where you connect a 60 mil lure lock syringe to a transducer, pull the plunger back, let it go pop, and see how long it would take that, that uh, square wave to come back to zero. Here's an underdamped transducer. Here's an optimal damped transducer. You see the difference? You don't want all these extra vibrations in it. So we've gone through that. You're always going to have some damping in the transducer. Uh, in any pressure measurement system. The damped natural frequency is a fraction of the natural frequency. This means that, you know, really what you want to do is you want to get the transducer with the highest natural frequency possible so that, uh, number one, you can reproduce those harmonics, and number two, uh, the farther uh, you are away from the fundamental or natural frequency, uh, the less likely you are to have that overdamp that underdamped situation occur where you are amplifying the small harmonics. So two good reasons to have uh, higher natural frequency transducer. So here's the day-to-day -day stuff. Sources of error. This is what you deal with every day. Viscous fluid. What viscous fluid do we deal with usually? Blood. Blood in a uh, transducer system meaning from the catheter tip to the transducer, is going to absorb energy, make it more difficult for that pressure to be transmitted. That's why we flush catheters. What other viscous fluid do we have? Contrast. Contrast. Same deal. Less so, but still important. And one more, even more viscous fluid. Blood clots, or at least as they're forming. Okay, compressible fluid. What compressible fluid do we deal with? Everything we deal with. Air. Air. Who said that? You're right. Air in a system uh, lends itself very well to damping. And if you think about it, uh, 
what are you doing? Well, you're converting kinetic energy to potential energy. You know, that pressure wave is moving forward, it hits a big air bubble, it now compresses <coughs> that bubble instead of stretching the transducer. So by the time the pressure is transmitted to the uh, transducer, there's less energy uh, in the fluid. And if you've got some time during a case, try this. Take your tubing, introduce varying amounts of air. I used to have a slide of this when we did it. Uh, and we'll very rapidly go from this, add a little more air, you'll get this. We're now damped. Add more air, you'll get down to a sine wave. It's not difficult to do. Uh, long tubing. We don't do that much anymore, but sometimes they'd hand you tubing. It would be incredibly long. And remember, tubing is dynamic. Uh, sometimes the pressure wave is stretching the tubing rather than the transducer. Bad connection. Goes without saying. Bad catheter. What's a bad catheter? Well, sorry. I'm sorry, not sorry. We use that all the time. One that's narrow. Narrow catheters transmit pressure poorly. Why? Because relative to the amount of blood go, or fluid that's in there, there's a relatively large surface area around the perimeter. So what do you get? Friction. So it generates heat. Um, what else is a bad catheter? A catheter that's compliant. Yeah, and again, uh, compliant catheter, same as compliant tubing. So you want to stretch the transducer. You don't want to stretch the catheter. So, I mean, you know, for Swan Gans catheters, they have narrow lumens and they're compliant, particularly if they've been in the body for a while and they're, they're warmed up. So, this is a problem that you have to be aware of. A bad amplifier, and then high heart rate. Um, if you go back to that previous picture with the sine waves, remember as your heart rate goes up, you know, the amplitude of those small harmonics goes down. And you have to reproduce more of them to get an accurate tracing. So in the ICU, it's a real problem because patients are really sick. They, they're tachycardic. And, and you've got bad catheters in them. So that's why, you know, when you float a swan in the ICU and you say, wait, uh, this doesn't look anything like what I get in the cath lab, that's the reason. Tachycardia, narrow catheter, compliant catheter. So if you're doing a right heart cath, you want a good RV pressure. You don't use a swan, you use a pigtail. For the right system. Yeah. You want if you're concerned that somebody's tamponading, or that rather has constriction, and you want to measure RV pressures accurately, put a pigtail in. Don't screw around with a half-ass catheter. I mean, you know, this one is easier to use. It's safer. Big, rigid catheters, you know, bump up against the conduction system, and you know, you can make patients develop heart block. You've got to be very careful about things like that. But if you want accurate pressures, use the appropriate catheter. Bigger is usually better. Four French catheters aren't very good for measuring pressures. Often they're adequate, but you know, it very much depends on the precision that you want to get. So I think we are out of time. Any quick questions? OK. Um, Nick, uh, what are you doing next year? What are you doing next year? Uh, <laughs> not sure yet. Okay. Well, regardless, uh, come back for this lecture. Fifth time around <laughs> is a charm. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Be here next week.